Even in the biggest moments, sports are quite generous in giving us some tremendous blunders. This is especially true in baseball, from blown calls, to boneheaded base running, to costly fielding errors. But there's one gaffe that never held the spotlight on what was one of baseball's largest stages. In fact, it came during one of the most infamous games in MLB history, a meltdown that denied the home fans a long-awaited trip to the World Series, 58 years and counting at the time. Just how costly was this mistake? What could have happened to the one who committed it? And this is where I invite your thoughts in the comments below. Where does this rank among the biggest blunders in sports history? So crack open an old style and grab a slice of deep dish, and I'll tell you about the biggest blunder no one talks about. We all know the story of the 2003 Chicago Cubs. They advanced all the way to the National League Championship Series and could have clinched their first World Series appearance since 1945. It's Game 6 at Wrigley Field. The Cubbies are up 3-0 in the top of the 8th and are 5 outs away from defeating the Florida Marlins to advance to the Fall Classic. Marlins batter Luis Castillo is working with a full count and is trying to knock in Juan Pierre from second. He lifts a fly ball down the left field line, and Moises Alou tries to make a leaping grab amid several outstretched arms. Instead, the ball is deflected by a fan soon after identified as Steve Bartman, so Castillo resumes his at-bat. But rather than focus on the fans and the media's ire directed at Bartman, I'll divert your attention to the actual Cubs players. After all, they still control their destiny with a 3-0 lead, right? Don't worry, we'll come back to Bartman later. Castillo walks and then Ivan Rodriguez singles to drive in Pierre, still 3-1 Cubs with one out and 20-year-old Miguel Cabrera to the plate. And then, on the first pitch. Clearly this is a routine ground ball and presents an opportunity for a double play to end the inning. Apart from maybe Jeter or A-Rod, there is no better shortstop to field the ball than this guy right here, Alex Gonzalez. That year, he led all National League shortstops with a 984 fielding percentage, committing just 10 errors over 152 games. He also has a clean sheet through all 10 playoff games and has already turned four double plays. But in this crucial moment, well... The hole is short and bobbled by Gonzalez and everybody's safe. How does one of the best fielders in the game muff that at this point? The ball ate me up, Gonzalez said. I didn't expect it to get there that fast. 20 years later, teammate Kyle Farnsworth added, when the ball hit his glove, Gonzalez said it spun. He said it was the weirdest thing he's ever seen. The gaff loads the bases, and in the next at bat, Derek Lee smacks a double to tie the game at three. The Marlins tack on five more runs to force game seven with an emphatic 8-3 victory. The next night, they finish off the Cubs and go on to win their second World Series in six years. As you know, the media and fans alike pile on Steve Bartman's arguable interference for costing the Cubs a trip to the World Series, complete with volleys of beer, chants of asshole and f you, and even death threats. But was his deflection any worse than Gonzalez's? Let's say Moises Alou made the catch for the second out. Juan Pierre would still have easily scored on the Rodriguez single, but the Cubs would still have a 3-1 lead with just Rodriguez at first. Let's say Cabrera reaches on the Gonzalez error, so the Marlins occupy first and second with two outs. Derek Lee doubles to score Rodriguez to make it 3-2. Cabrera holds up at third, while Lee is on second. Cubs manager Dusty Baker ended up replacing pitcher Mark Pryor with Kyle Farnsworth and intentionally walked the next batter, Mike Lowell. Let's keep that as is, so the bases are loaded with two outs. But instead of lifting a sacrifice fly, Jeff Conine simply flies out to end the inning, and the Cubs still lead 3-2. On the other side of the coin, Gonzalez's error presented a more dangerous situation for Chicago. Not only did he have a role in loading the bases for Lee's eventual game-tying double, but that also opened the door for the Fish to take the lead with Conine's sack fly and still have one out to work with. So with that in mind, why would Cubs fans point the finger at just an ordinary fan who may or may not have broken the playing field to catch a ball, something that hundreds of fans do every game? Why wouldn't they alternatively look at the on-field goof-up that, as I just mentioned, helped manufacture the would-be winning run? Kind of like, I don't know, maybe the most notorious blunder in MLB history? Oh, we'll come back to that. Look, errors happen in baseball. So do wild pitches, so do intentional walks. But fan interference? Well, you'd have to go back to Tony Tarasco to find a critical time when a fan altered the course of a meaningful game. To this day, that's something Orioles fans don't forget. 
no World Series appearances since then. Cubs fans, inside the friendly confines, outside the stadium, watching the broadcast everywhere, were fixated on that one moment suspended in disbelief. And before I even bring up curses, let's also remember the Chicago sports landscape. The mid-80s through the late 90s were a renaissance, but Windy City teams had largely taken a nosedive since then. The Bulls struggled heavily following Michael Jordan's departure in 98. The Bears had only two playoff appearances over the last 11 seasons, and the Blackhawks had just one in their last five. The Northsiders thought it was the Cubs' turn to give them a reason to believe. So when something this bizarre occurs in this big a moment within this Windy City context, even the most costly of mistakes could seem innocuous. Or at the very worst, it would live on as a mere footnote in a curse 58 years and counting. For decades upon decades, the misery of Cubs fans transcended the underwhelming trades, the cold bats, and the late inning meltdowns that are part of, well, just not being good. A billy goat who was denied a chance to see his team win its first World Series in 37 years. A black cat who wandered onto the field as the team choked away a division lead. A White Sox celebrity fan serenading the Wrigley Field faithful in the seventh inning with a 26-year-old fan who likely didn't see the rising glove of the home team's outfielder. To Cubs fans, these weren't part of a series of random events. These were interconnected omens. But as Alex Gonzalez would find out, no two curses are created the same. Throughout this period, another team was struggling to break their title drought, the Boston Red Sox. In Game 6 of the 86 World Series, they had blown a lead but were still tied with the New York Mets 5-5 in the 10th, just one out, one run, and a shutdown inning away from breaking the 68-year curse of the Bambino. The next pitch produced a routine ground ball to the first baseman. Once the ball was in his glove, he just needed to shuffle a couple of steps and, uh... The Mets, to little surprise, also won Game 7. One name would stoop below all in Red Sox infamy for the next two decades, Bill Buckner. He would endure a horrifying degree of scapegoating like Alex Gonzalez's shield, Steve Barton. We've been waiting for decades to try to get a championship and this goal lets the ball go through. Bill Buckner can rot in hell. How was any of that justified? After all, like the 03 Cubs, the Red Sox had made a plethora of mistakes to squander their lead. Twice, the Mets were down to their last strike. Without Steve Bartman, Gonzalez could have been the next Bill Buckner, and been so during an age when more powerful social media platforms were emerging and news could be recorded and transmitted to millions instantly. The scraps of food and cups of beer directed at Bartman could have instead been lobbed into the dugout. Cops could have staked out at Gonzalez's home. Reporters could have stalked him for decades and driven him out of baseball altogether. All for a ground ball that he couldn't wrangle with his glove, and from a fan base that's actually been down this road before. Let's rewind once more. After waiting 39 years following the cursed 45 World Series, the Cubs finally got back into the NLCS. In a winner-take-all Game 5 against the San Diego Padres, Chicago took a 3-2 lead into the bottom of the 7th. The Padres had one out with a runner on second. Normally an outfielder, Leon Durham was now the starting first baseman, following a Cubs trade to get future Hall of Famer Dennis Eckersley. Off the bat of Tim Flannery, out number two was on the way with this grounder and, oh boy. Right through his leg! Here comes Martinez! We're tied at three! The tying run scored, and Flannery scored the would-be winning run as the Cubs' World Series hopes were crushed yet again. Oh, and by the way, the player involved in the Eckersley trade with Boston was none other than Bill Buckner. You've probably heard the phrase, time heals all wounds. That holds some weight in sports, even with the most diehard of fan bases. I'll explain. If we want to continue the superstitious thread past 03, then let's look to a then 28-year-old Theo Epstein. Just two years after taking the reins as general manager, he helped turn the hard luck Red Sox into World Series champions, reverse sweeping the Yankees, and with a sweep of the St. Louis Cardinals, breaking an 86-year curse. Just three years later, they won another championship, and to celebrate the following season, they brought back a familiar face. Please welcome back to Boston, number six, Bill Buckner. It was finally the overwhelming moment when a decades-long scapegoat could be at peace with one of sports' most passionate markets. In my, in my heart, I had to forgive the media, uh, you know, for what, you know, they put me and my family through. With two championships and a lifted curse under his belt, Epstein took on his next assignment in 2011 with the Cubbies. Five years later, he got his counter curse working once again. The Cubs win the World Series! Brian makes the play! 
Unlike Buckner, Steve Bartman never made a public appearance. Even though fans petitioned for him to throw out a first pitch in the series, and team owner Tom Ricketts was interested in contacting him for closure. Fortunately, Ricketts was later able to gift Bartman a World Series ring. The once tormented scapegoat issued this response, his first public statement after 13 years. Most meaningful is the genuine outreach, signifying to me that I am welcomed back into the Cubs family and have their support going forward. I am relieved and hopeful that the saga of the 2003 foul ball incident surrounding my family and me is finally over. Moreover, I am hopeful this ring gesture will be the start of an important healing and reconciliation process for all involved. As for those 03 Cubs, even if some of them went on to win awards and maybe even World Series and continued their love of baseball in other roles, you gotta think that that last pound of regret had finally jumped off their backs and seized its haunting, especially for the starting shortstop. Gonzalez was much more succinct than Bartman in his elation and relief, texting reporter Ken Rosenthal, Yes, I love the Cubs. I can sleep now. Alright guys, well where do you think Alex Gonzalez's era ranks among the biggest blunders of all time? Let me know down in the comments down below. I saw this ranked as high as number 2 on MLB.com. Ahead of that was Fred Merkel's boner in 1908, which kind of opened the door for the Cubs to even get to the World Series. And then number 3 on that list was Bill Buckner's blunder. Now one crazy thing about that game was that Buckner was actually wearing his Chicago Cubs batting glove, and not just to the plate, but he did wear that glove when he committed the error. He also said something very foretelling even before the Red Sox had advanced to the World Series. The nightmares are that you're gonna let the winning run uh, score on a ground ball through your legs. So. Unfortunately, Buckner passed away at the age of 69 from body dementia, so rest in peace to him. Now, this video was special for me because I did live in Chicago very briefly in 2010. One of the first conversations I had there was with the custodian of my apartment complex. He saw me wearing a Cubs hat, you know, I'm trying to fit in here, and he says, hey, I really like your hat. I've been a Cubbies fan for my whole life, and I'd even see him around the complex wearing that from time to time. So six years later, when the Cubs won the World Series, this guy had been maybe in his early 50s. I thought, wow, he waited decades and decades and decades for his team to win the World Series. So I felt extra happy for him. I've got more videos in the works for you guys, but let me know in the comments down below if you have any ideas, baseball or otherwise. We're talking about scandals, controversies, bizarre histories, larger than life personalities, all that good stuff. So let me know if you have any suggestions. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out our video on the rivalry between the Miami Heat and the New York Knicks, our Bill Rose. Romanowski video and my video on the most violent headhunter of all time, Rafi Torres. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. I really appreciate your support here. I'm Nick, and I'll see you next time right here on Sudden Death Sports.